You know, when we are lifting our voices and praise and we hear the choir sing, I can't help but think of how the saints are gathered around the throne singing songs for all eternity and how one day we will join them. This morning we're going to look at the Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. We have last two weeks been traveling in the life and the Spirit and uh, last week specifically we looked at the unity of the Holy Spirit. This morning we want to look at the coming of the Holy Spirit. We hopefully can apply it to our hearts, to our lives, and as a family here together as the first Baptist Church of St. Charles. There is a truth in the Bible that speaks to the church, the true church, that we have a partnership in the gospel. Not only do we have a partnership in the gospel, but the Bible tells us that we are partakers of grace. This grace is often called the unmerited love of God, the unearned love of God that he has thrust upon us, and that is certainly the grace of God. But as we get deeper into the New Testament, we understand that grace, the grace of God, is no other than the Holy Spirit of God. And so the Bible, the truth of the church coming together is that we are partners in the gospel, that is to share the word of Christ, but we are also partakers together. We come here together and we partake. We literally share in the Holy Spirit that is gathered with us here this morning. This is the picture of the true church. This is the picture of the true believer. Those who partner together for the sharing of the gospel and equally partake of grace, who is the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God has been promised by the Father, and the Holy Spirit was sent by Christ to those who would believe in His name and in His work. It's interesting that we meet the Holy Spirit in the very second verse of the opening book of the Bible. As we just get started in the revelation of God, we read the words that the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And as we move forward just one chapter, we see in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, if it were not for the Holy Spirit of God, created man could have never had life in himself. For the Bible says that the Lord God formed man of the dust from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. We read in the New Testament that the Spirit gives life. And we read further in the New Testament that the Lord is the Spirit. We meet the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, early and often in the Scriptures. In church, there is a doctrine, there is a teaching of the Holy Spirit that we must cling to, yearn for, in the Bible. There have been outbreaks of charismatic type movements over the the decades in in most of our lifetimes here in the sanctuary. And so sometimes when you start talking about the Holy Spirit, sometimes people get a little nervous as if we're going to have another Pentecost break out in church. Why pray that would be so, but you know what? My prayer is already answered. Pentecost happened, it took place, and it's once and for all. We have the Holy Spirit with us today. But what does that mean? What does that do to the church? Let's look first of all that that to the church, we have the promise, we are promised the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, when he comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will glorify Christ Jesus, John chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. We see his ministry is to guide us and to teach us and to give us the words to glorify his name. You know why hymns are so special and so beautiful? You know why the music of the Lord stirs our souls so much? The Holy Spirit inspired those who wrote those words so that we could sing praises to God. The Holy Spirit gives us the ability to sing praises to Christ Jesus. And so when the Holy Spirit comes, he will not only guide you, but he will teach you. He will remind you of what has been written for your salvation. And what we're going to focus on a little bit today is that he will equip you to do the things of God. The the knowledge and the teaching of the Holy Spirit is of utmost importance for the church today, for the Christian. Even Charles Spurgeon, who wrote uh, wisely, he said, without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. Let let me say that again. We all all testify that, that in Christ we can do all things, and without Christ we can do nothing. 
I, I think the church needs to cling to that and understand that the Lord's Spirit is the Holy Spirit, and so that without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are as a ships without the wind. We are branches without sap. We're like coals without fire. Charles Spurgeon says, we're useless without the Holy Spirit of God. The true church has been blessed with the Spirit of God. He is witnessed today. He, he is present with us today. And church, he has been shown for the last 2,000 years. We have the, the record of the Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. If you're not in your Bibles, would you, would you open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2? And we're just going to read the first four verses. I'm going to refer to some Old Testament scripture. I'm going I'm to move around a little bit in the text of the Bible for one purpose, and that's to demonstrate the coming of the Holy Spirit and the application to the church. We're going to look at the purpose, we're going to look at the power, and we're going to look at the point, the application. But in Acts chapter 2, the first four verses, we read, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The writer of Acts, the Holy Spirit, using Luke to pin the words down, says, when the day of Pentecost came. He's, he, he's pointing out that Joel, the prophet in the Old Testament, had spoken of a day, and now the day has come. It was observed on a Jewish holiday of the Pentecost, but the prophet Joel was given the words by the Spirit in the Old Testament. He said in Joel chapter 2, verse 28, that it'll, it shall come to pass afterwards. After what? After Christ is born in Bethlehem, after Christ is crucified on the cross of Calvary, after Christ ascends to the throne of God, afterward it shall come to pass. And what shall come to pass, God said, is that I will pour out my spirit on all your flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. From young to old, male to female, those who belong to God, the God Spirit would be poured out on them. And we begin to see this in Acts chapter 2. And God's people are never the same because you see in the Old Testament, God would move his spirit on a prophet or a king in certain times to relate to his people and to give God, God's word to his people. But now God was going to do something different, something new, something incredible that was brought about by Christ Jesus, and that he was going to impart himself on his children. He was going to give himself to dwell with us instead of having to go to a temple to worship, instead of having to go to a sanctuary to find God, God would come to us and make his dwelling within us. And the power that was on Samson, the wisdom that was on Solomon, the 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 leadership that was upon King David, all that would rest upon us because that is God's Spirit working in God's children. This is for all. It's not just for pastors. It's not just for missionaries. It's not just for Sunday school teachers. If you are born again by the blood of Jesus Christ, I can assure you in the name of Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit of God with you this morning. The Baptist John, who in the beginning of the Gospels was at the Jordan River, he said, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming, John was looking for the Messiah. He was to point him out to the people. He said, but he who is coming after me is mightier than, I, mightier than me and, and whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Now listen to what he says. He, the one who is coming, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit in fire. Church, when you first receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, as you begin to grow in his word, as you've been walking with Jesus Christ, do you know the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life? Do you know of the things that the Holy Spirit has been able to bring about in and through you to give glory to Jesus Christ, either to your family or to the community? Maybe to help you equip the church and to build the church. 
See, it's not, it's not a mystery. It's not mysterious. We're not supposed to live our life in Christ without the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to be daily filled with the Holy Spirit, with fresh anointing so that the glory of Christ can be seen working in and through us. Jesus reminded the disciples of this promise. He, he said at the very end of Luke, chapter 24 and verse 29, he said to his disciples, he said, I'm, I'm sending the promise of my Father. And the promise of my Father will be upon you. But you stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. He was given an indication to the disciples that something incredible was going to take place. That, that what prophet Joel had, had talked about was going to soon take place, but they had a responsibility to stay. And then this, this power from on high, whatever that would look like, whatever that would be, would come upon them. I need to quickly mention that Jesus chose the disciples to be witnesses of the resurrection. They had one purpose. Jesus didn't choose them because they were better than everybody else. Jesus didn't choose them because they were intellectual or educated. In fact, they were fishermen, not to speak to anybody who's a fisherman here. But the culture of the day saw them as the lowest form in their culture. He, he, just, he just chose common people so that God could fill them with his glory and burst out and show the glory of God through the power of God from on high. You know why you were chosen? You know why you are saved this hour? So that God can fill you with his presence and bring glory to his name. There's no other reason, by the way. If you think that you're saved so that you can escape hell, you've missed the whole 66 books of the Bible. You need to go back starting today and redo it, and I'll test you later. You weren't, you weren't saved to escape, you were saved to dwell with the presence of God. And he has brought this presence to us. But Jesus said, stay in the city. He said, stay in the city until you're clothed with power. The disciples would be the witnesses. They were to share the gospel from Jerusalem all the way to the ends of the earth. The disciples who are the apostles, they were sent by Christ. They, 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 they were with Jesus from the very beginning at the Jordan River. Think about that. They walked with Jesus for three, three and a half years. They saw all that he did. They could testify to everything that he said and did. They were taught and trained by Christ. And they witnessed his betrayal on that Thursday night. They, they witnessed his arrest. They, they witnessed that bloody cross. And then on that third day, they witnessed the risen Jesus Christ who burst into the room through locked doors and spoke to them. They saw it all. They, they were part of it all. And on that resurrection day, Jesus came into that room. You might remember this. And he said to the 10 that were there, because remember Judas had betrayed Jesus. Remember, Thomas decided to skip church that night and he missed out on a great blessing because Jesus came into the church gathering and he breathed on them and he said what? Receive the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus says, wait in Jerusalem until you're endued with power on high. But Jesus has already breathed the Holy Spirit of God on him. What's the church supposed to do with this? What, what's the teaching for the church here? See, the, the disciples were sealed by the Spirit because of the word that Jesus had spoken to them. They were sealed by the Spirit of God because by faith they believed that Christ's blood shed for them gave them forgiveness of sin. They were sealed by the Spirit at this moment because they believed that in fact Christ did rise. Now remember, Thomas came and came back to church after he had skipped and, and he was able to, to, to touch the holes and to, to see the wounds. And remember what Jesus said to him? You believe because you see this? How blessed are those who will believe and don't see. But we come believing by faith and, and the disciples actually saw Jesus risen. They were sealed because of the word and the work of Jesus Christ. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit at the moment of conversion because you believe in faith that Jesus Christ died for your sins. You believe by faith alone that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Amen? By your amen, you have the Holy Spirit of God. That's unquestionable. You can't deny that. That's God's word. That's God's promise. Now, the disciples had this and Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem. So what we, what we must understand concerning the disciples 
is that they were sealed by the Holy Spirit of God on resurrection day, but not one person, listen church, don't miss this, not one person from the day Jesus ascended to heaven to the day of Pentecost, not one person near the church, not one soul near the church found Christ as Lord and Savior until the day of Pentecost. The church had no ministry. The church could not be effective in sharing Christ to the community. They had the sealing of the Holy Spirit, but they had not the power of the Holy Spirit. And so for 10 days from the day that Jesus ascended to heaven, 10 days until the day of Pentecost, not one soul was saved by the disciples' testimony. Remember Peter, he betrayed Jesus three times. Or excuse me, denied Jesus three times. You remember all the disciples scattered and run, ran. One even left his clothes behind, if you remember the story correctly. He was so scared. How did these fishermen, how did a tax collector, how did all this come about to where we see boldness that the world was turned upside down where before they couldn't even understand what Jesus was saying? Answer, they were endued with power from on high. They were changed. They were sealed at the moment of confession, but they were changed by the power of God. Question to the church. Are you sealed because of your confession of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life? And have you been changed by the power of God? If you question in your heart what that power is, what that power looks like, hang with me. And I'm going to ask you to desire that power from on high. It's already present. We're not going to have another Pentecost this morning. Pentecost has come. The question is, are we participating in the power from heaven? Are we participating in with the Holy Spirit. Remember, we're partners in the gospel and we're partakers of the grace. Not one person had received Jesus and so here comes the day. Acts says, when that day arrived. The purpose is that Pentecost had come. Acts makes that very clear. It will not be repeated. We don't need to seek a second baptism or any such teaching. If you've been taught that you get saved and then the Holy Spirit seals you, but somehow you have to to pray the Holy Spirit to give you another baptism. There's no such thing in the Bible, but be very careful. What we need to understand is that the, on the purpose of Christ, what he did through the Holy Spirit with his disciples. We, we need to glean from the scriptures what has taken place and what is intended for each one of you who belong to Christ Jesus. When, when we look at this, we need to see that he anoints us with fresh power for his glory. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Just, just back up a chapter. Jesus is speaking here in chapter 1, verse 8, and he says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Two things, power, and then you'll be my witnesses. They could not be a witness without the power. Clearly, we cannot be a witness without his power. The disciples could not share an effective word, they could not do an effective ministry without the power of the Holy Spirit. And neither can we today, church. If you want to know why the world is turning the church upside down, is we're ministering without the power of the Holy Spirit. Where we're doing it in man's ability instead of God's strength and power. We're running our lives. We're, we're running our parenting. We're running our, our marriages. We're running our grandparenting. We're running, we're running our jobs with man's ability instead of God's power from on high. And it's showing. It's showing in what's happening to our culture. It's showing what's happening to the church. How is it that every mainstream denomination is shrinking in size? How is it that church attendance in America is just dramatically being wiped out across the board from the east coast to the west coast, from the north border to the south border? How is it? And it's because we've been living on men's wisdom instead of God's power. And unless we repent as a church whole and go towards what God has done, we're going to continue to see this apostasy, this, this slipping away of the church. If the disciples could not share an effective word without the power from on high, we cannot do it either. We can do human-sized ministries that won't impact the souls of men. But with the Holy Spirit's power, we are moved in God-sized ways. Now, 
the influence of the Spirit on the disciples is what we need to say. see. In, in Acts chapter 1, go back a couple of verses to verse 4. Jesus says this to him. He's speaking to the disciples. He says, do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. Don't leave home base until you receive the promise of the Father. Jesus said, you heard from me, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. That word baptized means immersed. They'd already been sealed. They'd already been breathed out the Holy Spirit. He's saying now there's, a, there's an immersion coming up. You're, you're just going to be overwhelmed by the power of God is what he's saying. He says, stay there. Now, he says there's not too many days. You'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So not, many, not too many days from now is a reference to Acts 2.1, when the day of Pentecost arrived. This Jewish observance from the Old Testament became to the church a day that would forever be remembered as the day that God's power fell on the church and has remained. It's interesting, when you look at church history, you see when the church is moving in the power of God and you see when the church is not moving in the power of God. And it's interesting to note that when the church is moving in the power of God, the world is upside down. When, when, when the church is moving in the power of men, the world is just taking over the church. It's so clear in the history. You, you can't miss it. it. It was a day that was just, it forever changed mankind when God's presence and power came to dwell with man. It's a day which has never ended in the true church that Christ Jesus builds. Jesus said, wait, wait. How, how often do we hear in Scripture, wait on the Lord? How many has read that in the Bible and thought in their heart, what in the world does that mean? What does it mean to wait on the Lord? What am I supposed to be doing? Do I twiddle my thumbs while I'm waiting? Do I watch TV? Do I catch some sleep? What do I do when Jesus says, wait on the Lord? What, what does it mean? I want you to see three things, if I can get through these, three things that we find out specifically have to do with waiting on the Lord. Remember, Jesus said, stay in Jerusalem and wait. So the first thing, they obeyed Jesus. Put number one, obedience is to wait on the Lord. Obedience. I mean, how can we go on to greater things until we master the simpler things? If there's something in my life that I'm not obeying, how is God going to give me anything else until I take care of that thing? Amen? He, isn't that a principle in the Bible? If you want more, you have to take care of the little. If we've got a besetting sin in our life, waiting on the Lord means surrendering, give it to him, let God take over. That's what it means. So we see they, they obeyed Jesus. They went to Jerusalem and here, listen, church, I know I'm a pastor. I know I'm supposed to say these things, but this is now coming from the word of God. Acts chapter two, Acts chapter one, actually at the end of Acts chapter one. They obeyed Jesus by going to Jerusalem and what did they do? They stayed together. You want to know why the church has fallen apart in our nation? Because we're not staying together. We're spread out all over the place. We're on community fields. We're in community things. We're in all kinds of things, but we're not in the house of God. And the world knows that. The world has divided us, and the world loves it. Because if you separate Christians, they're not powerful. You put them together where two or three are gathered in my name. Jesus said, there I am. See, the world knows this. And so they, they try to separate us. First one is obedience. Stay together. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Does not the Bible say, do not forsake the gathering? We shouldn't even have a discussion about this. It says, do not forsake the gathering. But how often is the gathering forsaken? We grieve the Holy Spirit, the power moves away. We don't lose the presence of the Holy Spirit. We don't lose our salvation. We lose the influence of his sway over our life. And what is replaced is the world's sway comes upon us and we begin behaving and acting like the world. Number two, they devoted themselves to something specific. Verse 14, it says in chapter one, verse 14, it says they were praying together, including the women. It was the whole church. The church was not divided into groups. It, it was the whole church, including the women, even including the mother of Jesus. They were all praying together. It was very specific. A church can never enter the power of God absent from prayer. 
A church can never impact the community it is located in without prayer. How is it that in today's church culture, we call for a prayer vigil and pews are empty, but we call for a music time, we call for a fellowship of a chicken dinner, and you can't get a ticket, it's so crowded. Here's the answer. Prayers work. Prayer is work. And when Christians are on their knees praying, they're going to see the power of God, and I'm going to be candid with you. That spooks people away from the church. Don't believe it? Look at Acts. Go a few chapters down the road. When Ananias and Sapphira tried to lie to the Holy Spirit and they were struck down with a heart attack, what does it say about the community? Whoa, we're not going near that place. But what does it say in the very next verse? People were finding Jesus Christ day by day. Why? Because Christians were being genuine. Christians were being true to Jesus Christ. So you call a prayer meeting, people scatter. You call a fellowship dinner, people come. We need to reverse that. Pastors in their heart need to reverse that. We need to get more excited about prayer than anything else because a church cannot change a community without prayer. Number three. You might miss this one if you're not careful. It says they devoted themselves to some, it doesn't say this, you see this, that they devoted themselves to something seen in action. You can't can't find the verse, you can only see the action. And it's the word of God. They're praying and then the word of God appears. Look at verse 15. Peter all of a sudden stands up among the 120 people in the upper room. 120 people in the upper room. He stands up and he says, hey guys, I've been, there's something about the scripture we need to see here. It has to be fulfilled. Wow, you want to see a church that's getting ready to rock in the community? Have the people believe that scripture has to be fulfilled. As it is, most churches, they're debating on which scriptures are true or false. That's why they're dead churches. But, but Peter stood up and he said, Scripture has to be fulfilled. Uh, you, you, you remember Judas? The, you know, they started, yeah, yeah, I remember Judas. Yeah, that was a bad scene. He has to be replaced. Now, how did they get that without reading Scripture? Church, how can we get into the community if we don't know where God is taking us? We have to read the Scripture so we know where God is moving us. We have to be praying and we have to be reading together. If a church will not come together to pray and read the scripture, the church, I don't care what vision they have. I don't care how much money they have in the bank account. I don't know how, I don't care how many suits and ties or jeans they wear. They're not going to do a thing for souls of men. Not going to happen. Because this is the way that God communicates to us. Prayer and scripture. And this is the way that we communicate to God. Prayer and scripture. You take those two things away and all you have is a country club full of self-centered people. You put prayer and the word of God back into the business of the church as the primary business, the only business, the sole business, you have a community turning upside down. So they obeyed by staying together. They devoted themselves to prayer and they devoted themselves to scripture. That's waiting on the Lord. You go from Genesis to Revelation, there is no other waiting on the Lord but that right there. If you're hearing the Lord say something in your heart about a challenge that you have right now, you have something going on in your life, that's how you wait on the Lord. Prayer, Bible, Bible, prayer, prayer, Bible. Until God answers your prayer. Until God answers your situation. Anybody that knows me knows I'm not a scientist and I'm probably going to butcher this illustration. But I've recently learned about HSS. Hypersonic, or excuse me, hyper, yeah, hypersonic sound. I told you I'd butcher it. Hypersonic sound. Apparently, in the world of technology, this HHS, this hypersonic sound, has really just been an incredible uh, power that we've been able to see. Uh, From what I understand, the inventor is is Elwood Norris. His nickname is Woody, so Woody Norris. He injured sound waves to travel literally uh, 150 feet, excuse me, 150 yards in a very direct beam. He, 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 he somehow got the sound waves to go like a laser beam for 150 yards. This allows sound to be heard by a person who's in a particular place, but not anyone else around that person. So if I had a brother Dave stand by that wheelchair back by the sound booth and I lasered out the sound wave to him, but yet Robert Simons was standing right next to him, Only Dave could hear 
the sound, the command, the voice, the noise, the music, whatever it might be. That's called hypersonic sound. Now, interestingly, if Dave were to move to the left or to the right, he would no longer hear the instructions either. Because, see, it's a laser beam. It's going, it's going right to him, and if he steps to the side, he can't hear it anymore. The noise is only intended for the person the laser beam of noise is going to. You know where I'm going with this, right? God's communication to us is similar to the sound wave of an HSS. We must be in the right place to hear the Holy Spirit of God. If I go to the left, there goes the Holy Spirit's words right by me. If I go to the right, there goes the Holy Spirit's words right by, right by me. And if it's a church member and I'm a pastor, I get a phone call and I hear, why isn't God speaking to me? And I just want to say, move a little bit to the left. Move a little bit to the right until you hear. And the left or the right is get into the Bible and get into prayer and stop making excuses. Stop talking about your TV shows and your football games and start talking about the Word of God so the Holy Spirit can speak to you. That's how we hear. You can be a brand new babe in Christ or you can be a 50 years a Christian person. And if you're in that sound wave, the Holy Spirit of God is going to speak to you. But if you're going to continually step to the left or right, get serious about yourself and just understand you're not serious about speaking with God, talking to God, or walking with God. He's given us the command. Everybody knows we must be here. Everybody knows we must be in prayer. And everybody knows we must be together as God's children. We don't need sermons on this over and over and over again. This is the truth of the Word of God. We must be in the right place when we're in the right place, the message is clear. If we move away from the pathway, his voice becomes unclear. In fact, we even become unaware that he's even communicating to us. We hear a silence instead of the sound of God. Never forget that the pathway of God's voice is prayer and scripture. This coming was an instantaneous experience. This coming was for God's purpose. We're going to go more into this, but I, I just want to show you something that took place. When they were in that upper room praying and understanding Scripture, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 says, when the day arrived. They didn't have it on the church calendar. It was not part of a business meeting. They were simply doing what they had done the day before, being devoted to God through the word and prayer. And God shows up unexpectedly. They knew it was someday soon. They didn't know what day. And on the 10th day, the Holy Spirit of God shows up. And according to Acts chapter 2, verse 1, we know that God showed up because uneducated people started speaking the languages of all the people from all the known world that had come into town because of this day of Pentecost, a Jewish holiday. All these Jews from all over the world that had been scattered from the dispersion of the Old Testament, they now come back to worship God on the day of Pentecost they have different language. They're not speaking Hebrew. They're not Jewish in language. And so Peter starts speaking uh, Mede. And, and, and John over here, he starts speaking Macedonian. And, and then you have Matthew over here speaking some language from, from some other part of the Roman Empire. You have the ladies speaking foreign language. You have men speaking foreign language. Not one of them has gone to one day of school. Not one of them the day before even knew that language existed. But God's power came on them, changed their voices to speak what? Here's the testimony of the people in the community. What this means is the people that heard these voices, they, 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 they heard them speaking, and, and their testimony is that they said, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. Let me close it on this, church, this thought, church. Out in that community is all kinds of cultural barriers. All kinds of things that separate us from getting to know those people in this community. On that first day of church when the Holy Spirit came down, there was no way that they could have witnessed all those people in Jerusalem because they couldn't speak their language and they didn't know their culture. 
And in one day, 3,000 people found Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In that one day, 3,000 people were added to the church. And here's why. They surrendered to the Bible. They surrendered to prayer. And they surrendered being together in one accord. God showed up and changed hearts and souls. So the application is very simple. We can do it our way and get our way results. Or we can surrender to the word and to prayer continuously each day, which is a lifelong pursuit. And God will show up and lead and guide us. And we'll see people come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. It's really a simple formula in the Bible of God's grace. Dr. Paul Brand was speaking of Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. He was in India, and he was talking about how that let your light shine before men so they might see God's glory, which is in heaven. And in front of the lectern was this oil lamp, and it had a cotton wick in it, and, and it was burning from the shallow oil that was in the lamp. Robert, or excuse me, Paul Brand, he just kept going on and on like most pastors do. He said, I'm going to bring it to a close now by this illustration. Then he just keeps talking, and he just keeps talking. What happened is the oil ran out of the lamp. The wick kept burning. And as Dr. Paul Brand was speaking, the lamp running, had run out of oil, the wick, wick burned dry, and the smoke made him cough. He got choked up by the smoke of the lamp coming into his lungs. And he started coughing. Like most pastors, he used the opportunity. And he said to the people that were gathered there learning about this, he said, some of us here are like this wick. We're trying to shine for the glory of God, but we stink. Can you imagine me saying that to you? That's what happens when we use ourselves as the fuel instead of the Holy Spirit as the oil. When we're doing it of our own ability, we stink. The world doesn't want anything we have. They cough and gag when we come around them talking about our Jesus that we've made in our image. Because our Jesus and our image doesn't do anything for anybody. But when they see a life changed by Jesus Christ, a, a life changed that is devoted to God's glory, they want some of that. And so I'd ask each one of us in the invitation this morning, to ask God, not your next door neighbor in the pew, but ask God, does your wick, it, is it founded in the oil of the Holy Spirit so it's showing the light of Christ in this community? Or let's be honest, does our wick stink because we're doing it on our own? Ask God, let God answer the question. Let God answer that question about your heart. And one thing I know about my Lord and Savior, if we hear his words and we come into his words, he's going to show up in our lives. And when we surrender and turn it over to him and whatever it might be, he's going to show up in a grandiose way. Because see, when God's glory is shown, men and women are saved. Would you bow your head with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that as we Move towards the hymn of invitation, Lord. You would move towards our hearts even more. Lord, when we read your word, it is so clear how you move with your people. It is so clear how you speak with each one of us. It is so clear how we speak to you. And it is so clear that your salvation has been presented. But Lord, as humans, as in flesh, we try to muddy the water. We try to complicate things. We try to make excuses. We allow our priorities to get shifted. We, 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 we allow things to come in our way of, of worshiping and focusing in on you. We, we allow our pursuits to take over your pursuits. Lord, in this condition, I ask for forgiveness. In this condition, I pray that you would forgive anyone that finds themselves this way in this sanctuary, in this condition. 
But I praise you, Father, that knowing that I'm weak like this, that you are strong, that you are my rock, that you are my refuge, and that even now I can cry out to you and that you will equip me to be stronger. You've never asked me to do anything. You've asked me to surrender. And I pray, Lord Jesus, each day you would teach me to surrender. I pray each day that you would teach First Baptist Church of St. Charles to surrender. And when we've surrendered, I pray that you would teach us the next day to surrender so that we would never pick it back up and try to do something from our own ability. And I pray one simple thing can be done from the First Baptist Church of St. Charles each day. That in all that we do, all that we say, all that we speak, would be the glory to the glory of your name, Lord Jesus. That by your glory being shown, we would see men and women come to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Lord, use us, spend us, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Have us surrender before you. Have us speak of your glories. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.